Good afternoon, guys. This is a third and final video for chapter six. It's chapter 6.3, Controlling Chemical Reactions. Um, as always, you will need your chapter six classwork packet. And the one that says eighth grade, this is for periods four and five. Before we begin, you should have already done chapter 6.3. The key terms, again, uh, do a drawing in each box. It's gotta have at least four colors. And look up the definition in the back of the book. There are a total of five key terms. So this one's gonna be blank, you're only doing five, not six. Once you're done with that, you are ready for these notes. Once again, um, these notes are available online. You could always pause the video and record, but the easiest thing would be to go to my website and I'll show you right now how to find these notes on my website. So go to Google, Google Varela Science, one word, just like the way it's written right there, Varela Science. And once you're at Varela Science, find right here where it says homeschool eighth grade. Click on that. Same to my eighth grade page, and this is the one you're gonna look for. Camera's a little out of focus, there we go. Um, you have to download this one right here where it says Cornell Notes chapter 6.3. There you will get this Cornell note. You'll be able to download uh, and print it, or you could just get it off your computer, but it'll be a lot easier than just pausing the video and trying to record. So this will already be written. You should copy that in your notes. What we're focusing on is the EQ and also any Cornell notes that go on the side and the summary on the bottom. This is what the video is for. So let's get started. Okay. Chapter 6.3, Controlling Chemical Reactions. The EQ is what factors affect the rate of a chemical reaction. So we're going to learn that um, chemicals, they will react, but there are things that we could do to speed it up and slow it down. I mean, one thing you could think of is the reason why refrigerators were invented. Uh, the reason why you put your food inside a refrigerator is because obviously you don't want the food to spoil. If you left out a block of cheese in your kitchen counter um, or a leftover piece of chicken after a couple of days, it's going to start spoiling. Putting food in a refrigerator is actually slowing down the chemical reaction that bacteria has when it lands on that food. So when you're eating that leftover chicken or that cold pizza, there's probably bacteria on it, but it's a small amount of bacteria that is safe to consume. Your, your, um, your stomach um, acid will digest it, you won't feel sick. However, if the bacteria is allowed to basically multiply on that leftover pizza or that leftover chicken, you will get sick. By putting it inside a refrigerator, you slow down the uh, reaction of the, basically the biological processes of that bacteria. So it doesn't consume that leftover food as fast. It doesn't multiply as fast. Therefore, whatever bacteria is on that leftover pizza, it's safe to consume. So there are things that we could do to speed up and slow chemical reactions. Okay, um, First, we have to learn about what is activation energy. Well, it's the minimum amount of energy needed to start a chemical reaction. Uh, think of it as when you're trying to um, light some wood. Let's say that you have a piece of wood. I actually have a piece of wood right here with me. So let's say you have a piece of wood and you want to burn this. Well, what is the minimum amount of energy that you will need to get this wood to catch on fire? Now, one match might not do. So maybe we might need two or three matches. Or maybe we have to put a little bit of lighter fluid on it. Or maybe put some kindling or some, you know, just scraps of wood, smaller scraps that could burn. But burning is a chemical reaction. And simply using one match on that piece of wood won't do. You're gonna need a lot more. Well, chemicals are the same way. In order for a chemical reaction to start, you need a minimum amount of energy. You could also think of it as when you bake a cake. Um, if you mix up the cake batter, um, and you don't put it in the oven, you just leave it out aside, even if it's a hot day, like 110 degrees, that cake batter will not turn into cake. Now, what's the minimum temperature you need to turn that cake batter into a cake? Well, most likely, if you read the instructions, it'll say probably something like 350 degrees, maybe 375. Now, you could possibly go lower. Let's say your oven is broken and it doesn't heat up past 340 degrees. It might be just enough energy. It might be the minimum amount of energy that you need to be able to turn that cake batter into a nice fluffy cake. But Let's say that the minimum is 340 and you can only get your oven up to 330 degrees. It, that cake batter will not turn into cake. It'll just turn into a warm cake batter. 
there is a certain amount of energy you need to be able to start that chemical reaction. All chemical reactions require a certain amount of activation energy, some more than others. So, for example, um, you could cook cake at 350 degrees minimum. But if you need to do another recipe, uh, there's some recipes where you just need a lower temperature to be able to convert it. Um, I'm trying to think of maybe if you want to... Uh, can't think of something right now. Uh, cooking eggs, for example, you might not need 330 degrees to cook eggs. Maybe if you heat up eggs at like 150, it might be enough to finally cook the raw egg into something that's edible. Now, uh, the rates of chemical reactions. Uh, how can you speed up a chemical reaction? Well, it depends on th uh, four major factors. Uh, first of all, it's going to be surface area, which we're going to talk about in a minute. The other one is temperature. Uh, changing the temperature will speed up or slow down a chemical reaction. Also, the concentration of it. For example, um, you could uh, hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. It could burn through metal, but when it's diluted with a lot of water, so like a drop of hydrochloric acid instead of swimming pool, it's not going to do anything. But if you jump into a swimming pool full of pure hydrochloric acid, you'll melt. And then there's also st stuff called catalyst and inhibitors, and we'll talk about that. In fact, you have um, a catalyst literally in your car. It's called a catalytic converter, and it's the most famous catalyst of all. So let's talk about the first thing that we could make a chemical reaction go faster or slower, just surface area. So anyone that's ever burned wood, like in a campfire, knows that if you want to burn a whole log, that is darn near impossible to catch on fire. So, in fact, buying a whole log is a waste of money. Usually when you buy a firewood, it's what's called split wood. They split it. And the reason is, is again, I have my wood right here. Uh, imagine you have a big block of wood like that. Okay. Now, if I put that in a fireplace, it's going to take a while to catch on fire. However, what if I split the wood into three different parts? Okay, individually, these will burn a lot easier. I'll get a nice campfire. But if, it, if this was one solid block, I'm talking about before it was cut, imagine if this was just one solid block of wood. You would have a hard time catching that on fire. This is why when you start a campfire, you wanna start it with smaller pieces of wood, and then once the fire gets roaring hot, you wanna throw the bigger logs. Turns out that in order for wood to catch on fire, smaller pieces catch on fire faster. So, um, Split wood is good for, uh, you know, when the fire is just getting started, but that might not even be a good idea to start a fire. Uh, maybe you've heard of kindling. Kindling would be like small branches, split pieces of wood, the bark. Uh, it could be dried leaves. It's something that catches on fire easily. And, and the, the, the ones I talked about, like branch, like thin branches and stems, um, dried leaves, um, the bark, it's a lot thinner. See, there's more surface area. Surface area is what is exposed. Like what is exposed on the outside. Right now, for example, this wood is exposed. However, before I cut the wood, that part of the middle was unexposed. It wasn't exposed at all. So when you put a match on this wood, the match is heating up this wood on the top or on the side or here or on the bottom. The wood inside is basically like insulated, it's protected. But if you cut the wood, now you expose more of the wood to the fire. And since we now expose more of the wood, it's more likely to catch on fire. If I wanted to start the fire quicker, I could split this even more. So if I cut the wood down in half, I've exposed even more wood. I've made the wood smaller. I've increased the surface area, and therefore it's a lot easier for it to catch on fire. More surface area, easier to burn. Here's another one. A slice of pizza, why is it that when you shove the pizza in your mouth, your mom always says, chew your food? Well, that pizza is going to end up in your stomach. And that pizza is going to be exposed to your stomach acid. And that's a chemical reaction. The reason why we have to chew our food, and the more we chew, the better it's for digestion, is because by breaking up that pizza into smaller little, like microscopic parts even, if you could break it down into small little parts, that's more surface area for your digestive juices to break it down. Now, you can swallow, like take a bite and not chew and just swallow it down, but your stomach will not thank you for it. When you get old like me, it's going to be harder to digest. Chewing your food and breaking it down 
um, you may not know this, but uh, digestion does not begin in the stomach. Digestion begins when the food enters your mouth. Simply chewing on the food and exposing it to saliva is actually the beginning of the digestive process. And the more you chew it, the more you break it down, the easier it's to digest. Here's another one. Uh, remember um, that lab we did with uh, the hot and the cold pack? There's another type of hot pack. It's called hot hands. Okay, and I'll show you a picture of what hot hands looks like. Okay, so who's seen that before? Hot hands. You could probably buy it at Target or Walmart. It's great for camping. Um, you open up the pack, you put it in your pocket, and it heats up. Now, it's not like the 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 hot pack that we did um, in that lab. Um, when we opened it up, there was like a powder inside. This is different. This is actually iron shavings. So let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, so the hot hands, the secret ingredient is iron shavings. They literally get uh, a block of iron, piece of iron, and they cut it down. They shave it off until it becomes like this fine powder. Now, iron, when it's exposed to water or even moisture in the air, will begin to rust. So if you have like an old car in your backyard and, and you know, no one's driving it, after a while it starts getting old and rusted, um, that iron will actually release heat because when iron rusts, that's a chemical reaction and it's exothermic. It releases heat. Well, it rusts so slowly that even though um, it's releasing heat, you can't feel it. So the makers of hot hands, they realize that if you take that iron and you shave it down to like this powder, instead of this block taking like a year to rust, if you break it down to smaller pieces, this will rust within minutes. And so much heat is generated that it actually is, is enough to where you can feel it. So if you open up those packets of hot hands, there's actually two major ingredients. There's um, the metal iron shavings that heat up, and also there's um, sawdust, basically uh, wood shavings like this. And the reason why they put the wood shavings, it's a good uh, absorber of smell. Because if you ever smelled rusted iron, it smells like blood. I mean, it's not a coincidence. There's, uh, you know, you have iron in your blood. And the reason why whenever you bleed, if you if you lick your wound and you, you lick the blood, and the reason why it tastes like metal, that's the iron in the blood. So that's why when iron rusts, it has like a blood-like smell. And if you're using hot hands, a lot of customers wouldn't appreciate, yeah, their hands are warm, but it smells like blood. So they add um, wood shavings for the smell, but with the, with the iron shavings is what heats up. So basically this block has less surface area. So this would take years maybe decades to rust completely through. But if you expose more surface area, make it more into a powder, this will rust within minutes. And that's the reason why hot hands is only good for, you know, maybe like half hour. Once it gets used, there's no way to reuse it. You gotta throw it away and, um, and get another pack, okay? Next slide. Okay, here we go, temperature. Now, it turns out that when you increase the temperature, it makes the molecules move faster. Um, therefore, uh, molecules bump into each other more often, increases the chance for a reaction. So if you need to mix two chemicals, maybe you've noticed that whenever you're mixing, for example, like sugar into hot coffee, it's easier to mix than when you're mixing sugar into cold coffee. As a result of the, the increased temperature, the molecules are now bouncing back and forth, almost like, you know, they're, they're going crazy. And because the molecules, when they heat up, when they're slow, molecules travel slowly back and forth. And they could crash into other molecules, but not as hard. When you heat it up, that extra energy gives them more speed and molecules are now bouncing around a lot quicker. They're more likely to, uh, going to crash into another chemical and have a chemical reaction. Also, remember that we talked about that um, every chemical needs a minimum amount of activation energy. So because you're literally adding energy to the reaction, it's getting closer to its activation energy. Temperature is energy, okay? Anytime you rub your hands together, or like if you clap your hands, you'll notice that your hands will warm up, whether you're rubbing them or clapping them, because that energy from the movement is being converted from, from basically the, the kinetic energy is being um, um, converted to thermal energy. But energy is energy. So increase the temperature of your chemicals and it makes it a lot easier. Okay, and in cooking, that's another thing. This is why it's easier to mix your ingredients when they're warm than when things are cold, okay? Concentration. I mentioned this earlier. If you put like a, 
you know, a drop of very strong acid in a swimming pool, it's not going to be uh, that dangerous. And in fact, they use, when if you have a swimming pool, your parents probably use harsh, dangerous chemicals in a swimming pool, but they don't use a, t a, a big amount. It's not concentrated. You're diluting it in thousands of gallons of water. So to give you an idea of what, what do we mean by concentration, if you put one spoon of sugar into this cup of water, the spoon, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, a spoonful of sugar will spread out, but it, you have a low concentration. But you put three spoonfuls of sugar, now you have a higher concentration. But imagine instead of sugar, it was a chemical. Because of the fact that there is more chemical in this solution, there is basically more particles available to react. And then when you have something that's concentrated, anytime you add more temperature and you get these molecules moving, you're going to have a better chance that they're going to crash and react with each other. So adding more chemicals um, into a solution makes it stronger. Heating it up makes it move around. Do you do both? And the reaction speeds up a lot. So um, again, please know the difference between, uh, difference between low and high concentration. It's the same amount of water. The only thing that's different is the actual you know, chemical you're adding. Uh, finally, a uh, catalyst and inhibitor. I mentioned that there is actually a catalyst you should be familiar with. It's called a catalytic converter, and here's a picture of it. Here we go. This is called a catalytic converter, and it's um, found under your car or the um, in line with the exhaust. Basically, this was mandated in cars, I believe, in the 1970s. What it is is that when exhaust goes in through uh, this tube and it goes out the converter, the catalytic converter will basically clean up any emission gases, um, usually like uh, unburned hydrocarbons um, get mixed with the air and less pollution comes out. Now, this doesn't clean the car completely, but it does reduce smog applications. Now, the reason why it's called a catalytic converter is because you never have to replace this. As long as it's not damaged, you don't have to refill it like a gas tank. There is a metal in here. Now, they used to be platinum, but platinum is, is expensive. Platinum is more expensive than gold. So they use other metals similar to platinum, like um, palladium or rubidium. Now, these are still precious metals. What it does is that this is placed under the, not, it used to be placed near the engine, but now it's placed like a third of the way. It's placed near the engine compartment. And as the engine warms up, it heats up this metal inside. When exhaust gases go through the catalytic converter, the the platinum or uh, rubidium or palladium, whatever metals inside, reacts with the gases and the gases come out, but this metal never, it, get, it never gets wasted. This could last forever. In fact, um, because there's precious metals inside and because you could use old catalytic converters, as long as there's no rust and no external damage, you could put them in a car. This is a very popular thing that gets stolen from cars. Because people just, you know, jack up the car, you know, they put it up on, on blocks, they pull out the catalytic converter, and that's it. And they could put it in most other cars. It's universal. But see, the exhaust comes in, it reacts with this heated metal, and it comes out. And you never have to replace this metal. Now, that's what a catalyst is. A catalyst is something you add to a, to a, a, a reaction that you don't have to replace. You don't have to refill it. You don't have to uh, maintain it. You just put it into to this uh, formula one time, and this will theoretically forever do its job. So it doesn't have to replace like gasoline gets replaced in the gas tank or oil. You know, th those kind of things get used up after a while. A catalyst is something that just doesn't um, waste. But what it does is it speeds it up. So these chemicals breaking down into something that's less toxic may get broken down over time. But while it's not broken down, it stays in our air and we breathe it in. The idea is we want to break it down immediately so that way we don't, you know, introduce too much pollution at a time. So a catalyst is any material that speeds up a reaction. So an example is a catalytic converter that I just talked about. It's found in cars and also enzyme in your body. There are um, chemicals that your body makes called enzymes that speed up chemical reactions. I mean, there are some chemical reactions that in your body would take years, sometimes hundreds of years for these chemicals to be able to mix. But your body makes these special proteins called enzymes that when you add that enzyme, it'll speed up the reaction. Now, 
again, enzymes, like the catalytic converter, any kind of catalyst, it speeds up the reaction, but it doesn't break down. So your body makes sometimes these enzymes, and then it has to make another chemical to shut it down. Otherwise, it would the enzyme will keep doing its job. Sometimes it's a bad thing. You don't want you know certain chemicals that keep going and going once the job is done. Now, the opposite of a catalyst that speeds up a reaction is an inhibitor. It's something that slows it down. So food preservatives. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the myth that if you ever eat a Twinkie, that a Twinkie could last like 20 years. Number one, that's not true. Twinkies go bad after a year. However, Twinkies, if you've ever made like cake, homemade cake, you know that cake and bread go bad after a week. Why is it that Twinkies still are able to last one year? Well, they add these special chemicals called food preservatives. There's a lot of people I know, a lot of friends and family members that they try to go completely vegan and they try to go um, organic and they're like, well, I eat foods without preservatives. But that's a personal choice. The, the thing is, we need preservatives because hundreds of billions of tons of food are thrown away on a weekly basis. And on a planet with 8 billion people where half go to bed hungry, that's a lot of food already being thrown. Uh, preservatives allow food to last longer before they spoil. So if you ever wondered why a Twinkie can last a year, even though it's technically a little mini cake and it doesn't go bad right away because they add preservatives to slow down the rate that the bacteria um, or fungus or mold could break it down. Here's another inhibitor, HIV drugs. HIV is, stands for human immunodeficiency virus. And it's the virus that basically kills your white blood cells. And once all your white blood cells are gone, that's when doctors say you have AIDS. And you cannot die from AIDS. You basically die from AIDS-related diseases. You die from like an infection or from pneumonia or from cancer. Something that your white blood cells, your immune system should have fought off, but you don't have any white blood cells because the HIV virus killed them off. Um, when I was uh, in 10th grade in high school, I found out that Magic Johnson, point guard for the Lakers, that's when it was announced that he announced that he had he was HIV positive. At the time, everyone thought he was going to be dead within four or five years because many people that had HIV at the time, they were only given like four to five years to live. This was back in the 80s. But it was around the 90s that doctors had discovered these drugs that when HIV patients take these combination of drugs, they actually inhibit, they slow down the reaction of HIV. As a result, Magic Johnson, who is still, if you follow the Dodgers, he's one of the co-owners, we're in the year 2020. He was diagnosed with HIV, what was that, about 28 years ago. And the guy is in much better health than most of us combined. He still plays basketball. He stays in shape. Um... What's keeping him alive is not only diet and exercise, but also the advent of these HIV drugs. So he is still HIV positive. He unfortunately can still infect other people if he doesn't take precautions. Um, if you ever watch basketball, whenever you see a basketball player bleeding, they call a timeout immediately. And the reason why is because Magic Johnson eventually made a comeback into basketball and people were afraid that what if he's bleeding and he could get someone infected. So if you ever watch basketball and you wonder why in sports, even in soccer, if players bleeding, they got to take him out right away so they can stop the bleeding. It's because of fear of infection. Now, as long as he's not bleeding onto other people, as long as you're not sharing like an intravenous needle with him, um, it's perfectly fine. He will not spread the HIV. The HIV is living in him, but it's slowing down. And now we have um, people with HIV that take these inhibitors. They take these drugs that slow down the reaction. What's happening right now with COVID-19 is they're trying to find um, antiviral drugs. And it's basically, it won't kill the COVID-19, the coronavirus, but they're hoping that they could develop an antiviral drug like the HIV ones that will slow down the coronavirus enough where it gives your body a fighting chance. So um, we cannot make a drug that kills viruses. Only your white blood cells can kill a virus. But the hope is that we come up with an antiviral COVID-19 drug. So if you do get the coronavirus and you take this medicine, it slows down the coronavirus so your body can fight it before the pneumonia sets in and other complications. All right, guys, that's it. That's the end of chapter 6.3. We are done with the notes. I may be introducing um, other activities that will be strictly extra credit. Some of you have asked me, is there any way to bring up your grade? I'm thinking about doing an activity. Um, it will require Netflix. There is a documentary called Pandemic. So I'm thinking about having it where you could watch that documentary on Netflix 
answer some questions and get extra credit. But it's strictly extra credit. So if you don't do it, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, other than that, we are done. We're done with the packet. If you look at chapter 6.3, that is it. There's no more pages after that. So we're done with the notes. You should be done with the key terms. And you should do also the, the homework packet as well. And stay safe. Uh, remember, even though COVID-19 is um, not really spreading quickly in uh, people your age, and it's it's a very high survival rate for people your age, the problem is you don't want to get someone in your family infected. So it might not be deadly for teenagers. However, you're still able to get infected and you can infect people in your family that have a, a low immune system, compromised health uh, problems, elderly, those are the ones that are being affected. So um uh, you know, do it for your family, do it for your neighbors, do it for the elderly people in your life. Stay home. Um, keep that six foot distance if you go outside. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys uh, on May 1st. Okay, bye.